On November 24, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald, having been arrested after allegedly assassinating President John F. Kennedy, was being transferred from the basement of the Dallas Municipal Court's building to a waiting armored car. But in the brief moment that he was in the open, a man walked up to him, shoved a 38 caliber revolver in his stomach, and shot him. Oswald was pronounced dead two hours later. The killing of Lee Harvey Oswald on national television was dramatic and helped to spark decades of speculation regarding a conspiracy in the assassination of President Kennedy, but much less remembered today was the strange trial that followed. A trial to convict a man who had committed murder in front of millions of people. The trial of Jack Ruby deserves to be remembered. Jacob Rubenstein was born in 1911 in Chicago to poor Polish immigrants. He had served as a mechanic in the Army Air Corps during World War II and moved to Dallas afterwards. He was known for running dance halls, nightclubs, and strip joints, and at the time of the shooting owned the Carousel Club, a striptease club in Dallas. The murder of Lee Harvey Oswald meant that the country would not see him tried for killing the President of the United States, and in its place was the complex trial of a Dallas strip club owner who had shot a man on live television. The news media was in a frenzy and questions abounded. Two days after Oswald was shot, Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade presented evidence of a crime to the grand jury, which returned an indictment. In thee, and by the authority of the state of Texas, the grand jurors, good and lawful men of the county, present that Jack Rubenstein did then and there unlawfully, voluntarily, and with malice aforethought, kill Lee Harvey Oswald by shooting him with a gun against the peace and dignity of the state. Despite the media attention, the case would go through the usual process and try Ruby as if he were any other person accused of a crime in Dallas. But of course, that presented a challenge to the system. Millions had witnessed the shooting, and essentially no one was unaware of the emotionally charged assassination that had led to it. When the crowd outside the police headquarters heard Oswald had been shot, they reportedly burst into applause. A newspaper poll found that many people in Dallas thought Ruby should only be lightly punished, if at all, for the crime. Finding an impartial jury and granting Ruby a fair trial was no simple matter. Henry Wade said that in the trial, the whole system of justice is at stake. Lawyers scrambled to represent Ruby. Initially, Dallas lawyer Tom Howard got the job and insisted to the press that this is just another murder case. But it wasn't just another murder case. There were already almost 400 requests for press credentials for the trial from all the major nations of the free world. Ruby's siblings searched for someone more high profile than Howard and settled on Melvin Belli. Belli was one of the most famous lawyers in the country. He was known for dramatic and showy performances in the courtroom. He once brought in a pickled brain for the jury to examine and had part of a San Francisco cable car assembled in court to prove his client had been injured by a defective gearbox. He had a cannon on the roof of his law office that he fired every time he had a legal victory. Belli arrived in Dallas with a writer and a documentary filmmaker. He told reporters he took the case for the unprecedented challenge and argued that Ruby deserves a fair trial. On television, no one could see Ruby's state of mind. Ruby's trial was scheduled for February 1964. Both lawyers put together legal teams for the trial. Belli kept Howard on and hired his friend and Texas native Joe Tonahill and Phil Burleson, who had led the Dallas District Attorney's Office Appellate Division. Meanwhile, Wade built his prosecution team, including former FBI agent Bill Alexander, known as the Burner, and assistant D.A. Jim Bowie. The trial was to be presided over by Judge Joseph Brettley Brown, Sr. Like all of Texas's judges, Brown was elected. He had never been a lawyer. He was known for running a fairly laid-back courtroom and once said, I own 40 gavels and I never used one in my life. Though Brown had hoped to have television coverage of the trial, opposition from Dallas leaders and the state bar led him to ban cameras, radio equipment, and photography from the courtroom. The lawyers first crossed swords on December 23rd during hearings to decide if Ruby could post bail. The defense requested that both sides legally agree that Oswald had acted alone in the assassination and that Ruby and Oswald didn't know each other. We ain't agreeing to nothing, Wade answered. Ruby was denied bail, but a second hearing was held in January that Belli began to reveal his defense plan, arguing that Ruby had been in a fugue state during the killing and was legally insane when he pulled the trigger. Next, Belli motioned to move the trial out of Dallas, arguing that it would be impossible to find an impartial jury. The Dallas Morning News reported that the defense thought Ruby's life was at risk because of conspiracy in Dallas to deprive him of a fair trial, because of a highly emotional situation in the city, and because the news media covered the case so much more thoroughly in Dallas. Belli argued that Dallas wants to cleanse itself of blame in the assassination by giving Ruby a fair trial and then sending him to the slaughterhouse. 
The change of venue hearing became a large affair. The defense subpoenaed nearly 200 prominent Dallas residents, hoping to prove that Ruby couldn't get a fair trial in the city. Paper's been reporting anything and everything. Ruby pressed Ray Zauber, owner of the Oak Cliff Tribune, which reported that Ruby and Oswald were neighbors and that Ruby had been investigated by the House Un-American Activities Committee, and Zauber admitted that he had no evidence for either. The hearings took three days, longer than many trials, and at the end of it, Judge Brown declared that the only way to know if Ruby could get a fair trial in Dallas was to look for a jury. The proof is in the pudding, he told a reporter. But there might have been another reason that Brown didn't want to move the trial out of Dallas. In the book Kennedy's Avenger, authors Dan Abrams and Dave Fisher write that, as it later became known, Judge Brown did not want to move the trial unless he went with it. This was the case of his career, and he was not going to give it up. Brown had supposedly told Belli in private that the trial would be moved, but learned that judges in other districts wouldn't let Brown preside over the case if it was moved. It took 14 days and 162 people to seat the 12-person jury, though all but one had seen the shooting live or in replays. The law only required them to put aside what they had seen to render a verdict based only on the evidence presented. Arguments began on March 4th, but there were no opening statements. In Texas, the prosecution didn't have to make such a statement, and if they didn't, the defense didn't get to either. Thus began 10 days of legal battle over the fate of Jack Ruby. The defense plan was to argue that Ruby was insane during the shooting, thanks to an undiagnosed epilepsy disorder. According to multiple doctors that the defense called, Ruby suffered from a rare form called psychomotor epilepsy, now usually called temporal lobe epilepsy, and during an episode he would be unaware of his actions. He would act as an automation. This defense was supported by testimony from a police officer who said that Ruby's hand continued to contract on the trigger, as if he was trying to fire another shot, even after he was tackled to the ground. The defense also used witnesses to show how odd Ruby could be. He called his dogs his children, and one dog, Sheba, his wife. Ruby's old friend, famous boxer Barney Ross, testified that Ruby had had blackout episodes before. Ruby had gone to the Western Union office near the jail to send money to one of his employees, and the receipt put him there only four minutes before he shot Oswald. According to the defense, he just happened to be in the area at almost the exact same time Oswald was moved. The prosecution sought to prove that Ruby had been stalking Oswald, waiting for an opportunity to kill him. Ruby had been within sight of Oswald when he was brought out to see the press at City Hall, and a witness testified that he had been outside the county jail around an hour before Oswald was scheduled to be transferred. Another witness testified she overheard Ruby on the phone with an unknown person, assuring them that he would be there when Oswald was transferred. Around a minute after Oswald was shot, an officer testified he heard Ruby say, I hope the son of a bitch dies, in a normal tone of voice. Another officer heard Ruby say that he intended to shoot Oswald three times, shortly after the attack. Another testified that Ruby said that he first thought of killing Oswald two days earlier, that he did it in order to spare Jackie Kennedy the trauma of returning to Dallas for the trial. Repeatedly, the prosecution and police officers report what Ruby had said in the minutes following the attack after he was under arrest, and the defense objected that those comments were inadmissible and infringed on Ruby's rights under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. Judge Brown overruled all of Belli's objections, and Belli used this information to argue for an appeal. One officer's testimony may have recorded words Ruby said as much as 40 minutes after the shooting. Belli was not arguing that Ruby was temporarily insane during the shooting. Instead, he argued that Ruby's newly diagnosed psychomotor epilepsy had put him in a trance-like state during the crime. Belli's had to prove that to the jury with hours of complex medical testimony that Ruby had psychomotor epilepsy, based on psychological tests and the readings of an EEG. The defense called three experts who laid out what psychomotor epilepsy was, that Ruby had it, and that during an episode, Ruby wouldn't have been in control of his own actions. The most important of the three witnesses was Dr. Manfred Guttmacher, who testified that he didn't think Ruby was capable of distinguishing right from wrong and realized the nature and consequences of his act when he shot Oswald. While Guttmacher's testimony was important, Belli hoped to have Dr. Frederick Gibbs, the country's leading expert on EEGs and the psychomotor variant, but while Gibbs had examined the EEG, he declined to appear in court. The prosecution brought its own medical experts to the stand who disagreed with the reading of the EEG and the diagnosis of psychomotor epilepsy. Expert after expert offered their own opinion, and then while Belli was in the middle of cross-examining one of the prosecution's experts, Tony Hill announced that Dr. Gibbs would testify. Even Belli was stunned. Did you just call him? Belli asked. We assure you, Tony Hill told the court, he will be here. The problem was that Judge Brown wanted to end the case, and Gibbs wouldn't arrive until 12.05 a.m. on Friday, March 13th. He insisted that they were going to close this case tonight. Belli threatened to hold a filibuster and continue calling witnesses all night until Gibbs arrived. Finally, Judge Brown relented. 
Gibbs would testify in the morning. Gibbs' testimony as the last witness was highly anticipated, and the Dallas Morning News said that he reminded spectators of Gregory Peck. The EEG had been invented in Germany, but Gibbs and his wife were the first to construct an EEG device in the United States. He had first described the psychomotor variant in his 1952 book, Atlas of Electroencephalography. Gibbs was certain that Ruby had the disease. Closing arguments began at 8 p.m. on the 13th. Jury foreman Max Causey described the arguments. Each member of the team retraced the evidence as had been previously presented to us, while belittling that which their opponents had presented. The defense accused D.A. Wade of wanting to get somebody as a substitute for Lee Harvey Oswald. Belli was famous for his closing arguments. A Houston Post reporter said Belli spoke with a velvety hypnotic voice, like a symphony. The arguments lasted well into the early hours of the 14th. Wade was the last to speak. He asked the jury to give Ruby the same mercy and the same compassion and the same sympathy that he showed to Lee Harvey Oswald. The jury was instructed to sleep before deciding on their verdict in the morning. They deliberated for two hours, 19 minutes, before delivering a verdict. We find the defendant guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment. It read, and assess his penalty as death. The jury has made the city a shame forever, Belli told reporters. He refused to shake Judge Brown's hand. The verdict would be appealed, but Belli wouldn't defend Jack any longer. Ruby's family fired him, saying that they were disappointed and that he was most interested in his personal fame and fortune. Ruby's defense team cited 182 errors made by Judge Brown, including refusing a change of venue. While waiting for appeal, Ruby's health, physical and mental, deteriorated. He was interviewed by the Warren Commission, although his testimony was meandering and paranoid. Belli rushed his book, Dallas Justice, to print. Judge Brown wrote his own book and resigned from overseeing the trial when a letter to his editor implied that he was willing to lie about having already begun writing the book. It wasn't until 1966 that the appeal was finally heard and a three-judge panel threw out Ruby's conviction, writing that testimony about what Ruby may have said after his arrest shouldn't have been allowed, and that Judge Brown erred in not authorizing a change of venue. Ruby hadn't received a fair trial, but before the trial could be held in Wichita Falls, Ruby's health failed. He had cancer which had started in his lungs and spread. Jack Ruby died on January 3rd, 1967. It seems to be largely forgotten today that Jack Ruby never got a fair trial. Ruby insisted until the end that he acted alone, and that he had never met Oswald before. In the months following Kennedy's assassination, rumors swirled around Dallas, none of them ever proven that Ruby was a communist or a mobster, or even that he had run guns for Castro. An enduring interest in the assassination has led to decades of further investigations and many, many conspiracy theories. It is a controversy that doesn't seem likely to go away anytime soon. This coming Thursday, November 16th, 2023, the National Museum of Law Enforcement and Organized Crime in Las Vegas will be hosting a free virtual program, Lee Harvey Oswald and the JFK Assassination, Experts in Dialogue. Marking the 60th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's assassination, a panel of the nation's foremost experts will explore key elements of this enduring story. You can sign up using the link in the description or visit themobmuseum.org. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.